Okay. I think we can get started. How are you, Publius? Doing well, Mad. How are you? Th things are well here. Publius, um, I was thinking we can spend some time this class uh, talking about um, a specific part of, let's say, the side of V2, and, and that's the gauge system. Uh, and maybe we can start off you know, with what is the gauge system and how is it different from you know, how Beansoc you know, operates today, and why would we need something like that? Well, I don't know if we can call it silo V2, because there's already uh, a bit that's in discussion around silo V3.1. So this may be a silo V3.2 or something like that, per se. Uh, but what that would, just from a nomenclature perspective, I feel like it's important to be on the same page. But uh, Silo V3.1 is updating the way that seeds are accounted for, uh, such that now the seeds per BDV for a given deposit can change over time, whereas currently Beanstalk only supports static seeds per BDV. And... Uh, at the moment, beans, the, the bean price is at $0.94, cents, and to a large extent, it's uh, likely uh, because of the uh, wrong seeds per BDV ratio or the uh, suboptimal seeds per BDV ratio when it comes from the perspective of maintaining uh, the bean price oscillating above and below its peg, meaning the benefit... Uh, or the willingness of silo members to convert uh, from LP tokens to uh, beans is not high enough to return the bean price to oscillating above and below its peg. And it's, it, it's fundamentally, Beanstalk needs to have a system where the the ability for the protocol to adjust the seeds for BDV uh, takes into account the volatility of the bean price and potentially other factors like the debt level. So the question is, as the number of deposits or the number of tokens that can be deposited in the silo increases over time uh, and the Speeds per BDV can be adjusted in an almost arbitrary fashion. Uh, what a gauge system would be would be some way for uh, the seeds per BDV to fluctuate uh, autonomously based on some uh, governance mechanism and the the relationship between uh, the governance aspect of it, the market aspect of it. Uh, and the, the economic incentives around it are, are pretty complicated. Uh, and so it's uh, probably helpful, given that the base, uh, the base silo work is, is uh, being done to get to a point where a gauge system could be implemented. It probably uh, you know, does make sense to start that conversation on what a gauge could look like. Okay, and and I know and, and yes, as as you said that you know we we don't or th this is something that has been discussed and we've been discussing it for a while. And I was hoping that we can talk more about you know what would a gauge system look like and how how would the community um, or let's say stockholders want to want to look look at uh, um, um, at it uh, or, or how to use it. And uh, Publius. Maybe before talking about um, the gauge system itself, because that impacts uh, whitelisted assets, we can take a step back and and think or ask the question of what assets you know do we think as as stockholders uh, we want to whitelist into into the silo. So maybe the question is, what are the minimum requirements for an asset to be whitelisted into the silo to begin with before even you know. Giving it, giving it any any gauge vote or any any seeds, or I say different different number of seeds because they all, would all assume get, getting seeds once they're whitelisted. Well, it's important to note that the 
beans in an LP token. So if you have beans against X, uh, there's some, you can probably deposit the bean XLP token in the silo and have uh, the seeds per BDV associated with a normal bean deposit. The question is around whether or not there should be some bonus uh, in terms of seeds per BDV around the provisioning of liquidity to bean stock in the form of uh, some desired value uh, for beans to be A, liquidated against, and B, priced against. And so while Beanstalk doesn't have a collateral, Beanstalk does have liquidity. And there is an open question as to the management of that liquidity and the optimal construction of that liquidity. And the, to some extent, the goals around the liquidity Liquidity that Beanstalk trades against need to be highly aligned with the goals of Beanstalk, which is censorship resistance, decentralization, and uh, strong economic uh, and economic incentives. So there's some open question as to what are the optimal assets to be trading against. Uh, but the the starting point is that Beanstalk has to think about the selection of assets from a risk management perspective, first and foremost, in the sense that the value of the liquidity that beans trade against is not solely a function of bean stock and often isn't a function of bean stock. So on the one hand, and there are trade-offs everywhere. On the one hand, you can prioritize having liquidity against Ether uh, because it's uh, maximally decentralized. Uh, but it's also highly volatile. Uh, you can have uh, liquidity against LUSD, which is uh, similarly decentralized to Ether uh, and less volatile, but has less competitive carrying costs. Uh, so uh, th there's some open question as to the the optimal... I, I mean, then you can have... you know low volatility centralized assets. Currently, Beanstalk trades against 3Curve, which is Tether, USDC, and DAI, which is in and of itself mostly centralized collateral. So currently, Beanstalk has exclusively centralized, collateralized uh, stablecoin exposure. And the hope is that with Wells, there will soon be uh, a variety of assets trading against Bean again. And there's an open question as to how the DAO should evaluate risk associated with uh, any given liquidity and managing that risk such that Beanstalk can have a variety of different assets trading against it and whitelisted for deposit in the silo. But more than that, the there's some mapping that needs to be done between uh, the risk uh, associated with any set of uh, or distribution of exposure within within the silo to beanstalk and what the market has demand for and supply for uh which is a sort of a very interesting open question so those are maybe the axes on which uh this optimization can be thought about okay let's maybe try to redefine the minimums so you mentioned one of them is that the the asset first of all has to be traded against beans, right? So we can we can assume that it will be some sort of a liquidity pool or a well, and that is the first minimum. You mentioned another point, Publius, and you said that that asset you wouldn't want it to be issued by Beanstalk. I'm I'm going to ask a hypothetical question: If pods were, you know, what what, what do you mean by that? I I don't I, I don't think I said that. Okay, uh, m maybe I misunderstood it. So I'm, I'm going to give an example and, and tell me if you think this is something that can be, you know, such an asset can be whitelisted. If pods, for example, were like liquid, 
you know, in, on secondary markets or, you know, there were liquidities at which you can somehow price uh, pods. Maybe pods isn't a great, a great example, but we're going to assume that they're fungible uh, for, for, for a moment there. But the, the idea being that it is issued by, by Beanstalk. Would, would a bean versus another asset, and, you know, in this case, we're using pods as an example. So a bean and an asset that's issued by Beanstalk as well, can, can that in theory be whitelisted in the silo or it always has to be an asset traded against bean that is not issued by, by Beanstalk? So the issuance doesn't matter per se. Uh, the point is that it's a question as to whether or not there is some sort of additional seeds per BDV to credit the deposit in addition to the beans in the deposit. So you create a bean pod LP token, uh, the, the beans in the LP token can be credited with, with seeds, but the pods cannot be credited with seeds uh, in this instance because the value of pods is derived from the value of bean, as you were suggesting. So I guess it does sort of matter about the issuer. Now, if you have any sort of value outside of bean stock, there is still an open question as to whether that liquidity qualifies for additional seeds for BDV, which is where the gauge system would be introduced. But there are certain qualifications that are essential because if you have, let's say you, there are security implications here. If you have some token, this is why it can't just be totally arbitrary. If you have some token that you control 100% of the supply of, you can uh, deploy the token against Bean uh, at a crazy high valuation for your token and then add a significant amount of liquidity uh, in your token on one side of the liquidity pool token. So your token has a high Oracle price, uh, high BDV, uh, per, high token per BDV ratio. Uh, and if you're getting credited for depositing those tokens in the silo, now you can just mint stock effectively and take over the system. Whereas if you're only getting credit for the beans in the LP token, it's effectively the same as just having deposited beans in the silo, which uh, makes sense. The question is around whether assets are adding any sort of li liquidation value to Beanstalk as an ecosystem. And if the asset is issued by Beanstalk, then it's too circular. Pods having liquidity against beans would not add value to the ecosystem. Whereas if the pods had some sort of liquidation value against ether, you could make an argument that if the pods could be liquidated for something else because there's some other value, uh, like a pod per e a pod ETH LP token, uh, but but to some extent, then Beanstalk would ra really just want to pay for the ETH. There's no benefit to Beanstalk for giving credit to the pod bean LP token holder for depositing it out in the silo. Uh, it, 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 whereas the, there is a benefit to Beanstalk for encouraging a, an each pod LP token, for example, which is interesting. Now, currently, Beanstalk doesn't facilitate the deposit of pods in the silo and doesn't give credit for that. There's an open argument as to whether uh, it, you could deposit some sort of LP token to bid for any Beanstalk asset uh, and deposit that in the silo, but probably think that that adds additional complexity that is unnecessary to the model and better to keep the primary liquidity in the system that the, the, the silo is denominating value in, in Bean, but perhaps could be wrong on this. What about root? Do you think root, a Bean root, pool would make sense to be whitelisted or would it be like a root ETH uh, pool similar to what you suggested? Well, you could do a root bean LP token, but don't think that it would necessarily make sense to give it additional seeds, although you could make an argument it, it, it qualifies for slightly additional seeds if it's in the interest of bean stock. Uh, to have root liquidity. Uh, so there's some argument there. Uh, 
which is interesting because that would actually be an argument in favor of even having the potential to give a bonus for bean pod liquidity on the pod side because Beanstalk wants liquidity for pods. Uh, to some extent, I think this is actually something that the gauge system could ultimately handle. A sophisticated gauge system could say the maximum additional uh, seeds per BDV on Beanstalk, uh, bean to bean pairs or Beanstalk to Beanstalk native assets is, uh, is, is, you know, twenty percent of uh, whatever the bean, bean per BDV. Uh, I guess the bean seed per BDV ratio is. You could have a cap on the bonus, but you could have some bonus, uh, and the bonus could be changing based on some other factors. Uh, so a sophisticated gauge system could handle any sort of arbitrary rules like this, and. As we're thinking here out loud about it, yeah, there is an argument for, you know, maybe temporary or full-time bonuses uh, for certain bean-to-bean or beanstalk-to-beanstalk uh, asset pairs. Interesting uh, question. <laughs> yes, I think as, as we're more talking about this, more, we're getting more questions, but interesting questions. Guy asks, when thinking about what beanstalk can offer to incentivize particular behavior, for example, incentivizing conversions when the, when the time between peg crosses is increasing. When should it offer more stock versus more seeds? Fascinating. So the stock is really a mechanism that is focused on the ownership distribution of bean seniorage such that bean stock uh, becomes more decentralized over time. And from that perspective, and, and then also to introduce opportunity costs for leaving the silo when the system is not minted. And uh, the, there's an argument to be made that the seeds for BDV should trail off, uh, excuse me, the growth in stock for BDV on a given deposit should trail off as the age of the deposit uh, increases. So there's some maximum seeds per BDV, uh, excuse me, stock per BDV on a deposit uh, that could really have uh, some sort of effect on the decentralization of beans over time, particularly in terms of the advantage of older depositors. Uh, but that's sort of a marginal uh, benefit. But the point is that stock is focused on the long-term ownership distribution of the system and decentralizing it, whereas seeds are the marginal incentive around which assets to deposit in the silo. And so the seeds per BDV and fluctuating that or changing that is a way to, at the margin, affect the construction of deposits in the silo that Beanstalk is incentivizing, whereas changing the way that stock is uh, distributed in the grand scheme of things in terms of is it linear uh, growth from seeds or is there some sort of function uh, over time based on the age of the deposit? Uh, that, is, that, that question should be answered in the context of uh, ownership distribution of bean stock. Okay. All right. So Publius, now we have assets that are whitelisted into the, into the silo. And you mentioned a few axes, let's say, that the that stockholders or or the DAO members can optimize around. Um, one of them is decentralization or how decentralized that asset is. Maybe another point of it is you know the stability of that asset. So ETH versus something something like USDC um, um, or or a stable coin. What about how liquid is that is that asset or you know how is there deep liquidity or how you know how much liquidity is available to that asset. Is this something that stockholders will want to care about or it doesn't matter? Well, things get particularly interesting when you have like an n-dimensional well order where now you have multiple assets being put into a 
a single well potentially, and this is in the future, uh, where you have more than one asset trading against a single bean, now you really have to evaluate the value of the the assets individually. But now the question is that the liquidity is somewhat triangular, right? And how do, do you double count liquidity? What does it mean to actually have liquidity? So sure, liquidity of an asset is something that Beanstalk should certainly consider. But in the grand scheme of things, there's some open question as to the real uh, liquidation value of the entire system and whether a marginal uh, a marginal deposit actually creates additional liquidation value for Beanstalk. So, yeah, it's an interesting question as to what liquidity actually means in this in this context. Okay. F following that, how do you think, or how would you think, you know, the stockholders again would want to value each of these of these axes? Is decentralization more important than you? Know, I don't know if the, if the asset is stable or or volatile. Is it is that more important than you know how liquid that asset is? And 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 maybe maybe it's not like one is important than the other. Um, is it like depending on the time, then one thing becomes more important than the other? So, think that in the grand scheme of things, decentralization is is essential when it comes to liquidity against beans, but it's also important to recognize that there is limited available uh, decentralized endogenous value on chain. And so a lot of the value is either going to be wrapped uh, ether or uh, it's going to be some sort of centralized issued collateralized asset. And that's or some wrapper thereof, right? Frax is a wrapper of USDC. So you can have USDC, you can have Frax, you can have uh, Ether, or you can have Rye, uh, or you can have LUSD. So there's all variations of endogenous value uh, or exogenous value and uh, volatility, low volatility, uh, yield generating, non-yield generating. And instead of saying that, you know, there, there needs to be a, a maximal focus on decentralization at any it, to your point mon uh there's some question as to managing risk in in both in real time with the market uh and allowing the market to really do its job in regulating exposure that beanstalk has uh but also creating principles or rules that the gain system can enforce that the dow has uh whitelisted effectively for example that uh, you know, wrappers in wrappers of centralized held collateral uh, can only be uh, incentivized with additional seeds for BDV uh, when it has less than 50% of uh, total liquidity uh, trading against beans in the silo, for example. Uh, and the seeds per BDV could be adjusted based on some uh, some function that is figuring out what is the liquidity trading against beans and how much of it is centralized, uh, uh, centralized, uh, collateralized, uh, collateralized by some sort of centralized uh, system, or whether it's an endogenous value or wrapper thereof, uh, which is decentralized. And that would affect, uh, there, there's a couple ways to then change how, what do, you, do you affect the marginal depositor, like the new depositor? Do you dilute everybody if people continue to deposit? Uh, that's an implementation question, but, uh, or an incentive question as well. But the point is that this is, these are the rules like that are probably the best way to think about how to create a, a a good risk managed system where there are certain rules that the gauge system is enforcing with, with incentive. Okay. We have a question from sweet red beans and it's with uh, regarding wells and they ask, 
Can an additional pump be added to a well which has already been deployed, or does adding a pump require deploying a separate well? So as of now, the wells are immutable, as I understand it, and therefore the pump cannot be added after deployment. Uh, and so there is some question as to whether or not that's the optimal way to construct wells or whether there should be governance at the well level. Uh, in theory, the owner of the well uh, could, could, change, could change it, I guess. Uh, but it's, it's also probably better practice, particularly if there is a well-designed gauge system, to encourage the deployment of new pumps that then people can move their capital over to manually as opposed to forcing people onto new, uh, new wells per se, if that makes sense. So the real goal is to have a, a, a system that has very low friction around deploying similar competitive wells that have the exact same benefits in terms of seeds per BDB. And then users or depositors of the system can choose which wells they want to deploy liquidity to, and they are totally unaffected by technical things like pumps, unless Beanstalk wants to encourage particular pump implementations because it's beneficial to Beans, in which case that could also be added to the, to the gauge system. Okay. Publius, do you think there is some logic or thinking behind limiting what percentage a certain asset has within within the silo or you know this is something to be decided by by stockholders i mean it, it is something to be decided in the end by stockholders but do they want to like say for example that you know we don't want over 50 percent to be a certain asset or m maybe it's best practice to limit a certain you know asset to be no more than 15 percent of the overall system Yeah, and there's a question as to how those rules should be implemented, and those rules should probably apply not just at a token level, but at certain property level. Like, uh, again, who issues the sets? Maybe there's multiple assets uh, that are collateralized, but they're, they're, they're collateral is custodied by the same uh, company, or the, custody, the assets are custodied in the same countries. Uh, and there's certain ways that those limits can be put on not just individual tokens, which certainly makes sense, uh, but also uh, at the property level. And when a token is whitelisted for additional seeds for BDB, in some capacity, it, 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 when the whitelisting takes place, whatever that consists of, uh, it should ultimately... Uh, come down to different properties, uh, different properties, some sort of registration of different properties, such that such that the the gauge system can know what the asset actually, what risks are associated with the asset, and there may be some process that needs to happen around verif verifying. Uh, that the information around the properties is accurate. So to some extent, there is a balance here between permissionlessness and risk management, that there is some, some sort of verification that should happen around uh, the properties that are listed for a given token. And, and while we're at or discussing risk, do you foresee some sort of a bribe system happening once uh, you know, a system like the gauge system goes live, and if yes, is that is that positive or or negative? Maybe it is good to have you know some sort of a bribe system. Well, you can't really help it uh, to some extent, and uh, one of the philosophies that we've always had uh, held is that if if you can't prevent it, uh, then you have to embrace it, and so. Uh, ultimately, there probably will be some sort of market around providing liquidity to a given asset uh, or providing seeds per BDV gauge for a given asset. And that's probably 
something that should be factored into how the marginal seats for BDV are voted on by a given stockholder. And this also factors into the more general decentralized governance question around uh, bribing depositors to vote on given, given things once there is uh, some sort of ability to borrow uh, deposits, which is going to be going to be possible pretty soon. So bribing applies not just at the gauge level, but governance in general, and should be should be factored into the discussion. And however, the gauge is ultimately accounted. All right, we have another question from Sweet Red Beans about wells, and they ask. Would the liquidity be fragmented if there were many different wells with different pumps but containing the same asset? Or would the liquidity be aggregated somehow when trading against wells with different pumps? Uh, from a user perspective, the liquidity would be aggregated. So uh, I believe it's the aqueduct uh, that performs the aggregation of all of the different uh, pumped wells. All right. Okay. So we now have a guest. Maybe just to add a little more color. The aqueducts is a registry of pumps. And so the, the idea is that you have these wells that have pumps that have some sort of information about what is going on in the pump, in the wells, excuse me. And then those, the information that is pumped is then aggregated at the aqueduct layer. So some of that information may be, uh, Used to create great user experiences where they just are able to trade directionally against the most efficient liquidity. Yeah. So from from a user's perspective, the the sum or the amount of liquidity available for an asset would be the sum of all of the assets available in in different wells, and then depend which well exactly are they you know trading against would be. The, the efficient well, but you know, the decision on what is the most efficient well is, is to be decided, I guess, later. Or agreed on. Okay, Publius, we now have a gauge system that's live, and stockholders can vote for which asset they they think is, you know, has more value to the to the ecosystem, and then they would they would value it with more with more seeds. How often do you think this this process or this vote, you know, goes. Is it continuous and live all the time and just depending on someone's changing their vote, then, you know, the seas would change or would it be periodic, maybe once a week, once a month, once a quarter? It's unclear what it should be. There's something to be said for, for continuous, uh, meaning real time or every season, but that type of uh, question is probably best answered in the context of what the gauge system actually will look like. I mean, what the mapping is from stock uh, voting on given assets to the actual seeds for BDV. And I think the first question on that front is how many assets can you vote for uh, if for a given stock? Are you distributing your stock across, you know, if you have one stock, could you distribute that stock uh, voting for uh, N different sets with one stock? Or is that stock, uh, does that one stock have to be divided up across the N sets that you vote? And I think that it's probably necessary to make it such that the one stock is divided up, so you have to choose where your uh, stock decreases. Now, maybe you could have some sort of quadratic system where uh, the more that you vote on, the value of your vote across them decreases, but it doesn't cause you to divide it uh, linearly, uh, which is worth considering. Uh, and then based on the stock uh, that is allocated for a given asset, that needs to then get filtered through uh, the set of rules and mapped to some 
seeds per BDV, and the seeds per BDV needs to be at a range between the beans, the seeds per bean uh, deposits, and there's also an open question as to the the ratio between beans and liquidity, which is the current imbalance causing the price deviation in general. The gauge system and stockholders should be able to vote on the general relationship between seeds per bean and seeds per LP tokens, and then separately the, the voting around the distribution of the liquidity that beans trade against, if that makes sense. So there's two axes, which is the beans to liquidity ratio, and then separately the distribution of the liquidity, uh, and there needs to be a mapping between the votes for each of them. All right. Um, I'm going to pause here and see if our audience have any questions that you know they would like to ask about the gauge system, wells, or or any other topic. Um, so you you can drop it to town hall chat, or again, feel free to join join on stage. You can raise your hand, and we'll bring you on stage. Okay, Publius. Before ending this class, any thoughts or closing uh, comments on how the DAO want, will want to approach the gauge system? And is, is there anything to think about from now until you know, such a system is implemented? Well, there seem to be a variety of open questions, right? There's a question as to the properties that are important for the DAO to vote on in terms of limiting its exposure and risk management. Uh, there's a question as to how to implement uh, that in as permissionless a way as possible. There's a question as to how to actually value real liquidity. Uh, there's a question as to how to map uh, stock votes uh, for the distribution of given liquidity to seeds per BDV in the context of the the rules that the DAO has whitelisted uh, and there's also the question as to how to map the stock uh, that is being voted on around peg maintenance uh, in terms of the beans versus uh, liquidity incentives and what are the what are the things that should be optimized around uh, on that front and whether that should be something that is voted on or whether it's just totally autonomous uh, versus a continuous uh, vote. I Meaning, is this is this too volatile or not? Maybe that's a separate, very interesting question. To uh, is that something that it does make sense to to leave up to some sort of more fluctuating uh, incentive based on volatility? Okay, we have a question from Sweet Red Beans, and they ask, what ideas have been discussed regarding the appropriate implementation of a network layer oracle that updates off-chain data at the beginning of every block to ensure that wells have accurate pricing data? So maybe to give a little bit more context on the question, uh, wells facilitate the implementation of full strategies uh, in a given order, in theory. And the idea behind that is that you never need to update your order. Uh, and the reason for that is that in, a, in an environment with MEV, you can't actually update your order. Uh, so by creating orders that uh, never need to be updated, you could, because you're encoding full strategies, you get around the, the fact that you can't update your order. And the, there's a couple of network layer problems around uh, encoding full strategies on chain. Uh, there's, there's two primary ones uh, to highlight. One is privacy, which is that you don't really want to uh, publicly show what your full strategy is. 
Uh, and two, uh, which is what Sweet Red Beans is asking about, is that if the Oracle data that the order is uh, using to come up with its price uh, is, uh, is receiving data off chain, meaning the Oracle is not on chain entirely, uh, the issue is that if the Oracle isn't updated before the well, uh, the, the order is traded against, then you lose the property that the order is always up to date. And so there is some need uh, to have at the network layer the ability to uh, enforce the fact that the, the Oracle has been updated before the well can be traded against. Uh, this problem also applies to liquidations where you will need in order to ensure that there is uh, no risk of a liquidation uh, uh, failing or a, a, a lending protocol taking on bad debt failing because uh, liquidity was removed, making it such that bad debt would accrue. So there's certain uh, integrations between oracles and the network layer that seem essential to creating uh, a, 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 a finan an environment for decentralized censorship-resistant financial activity that can be uh, out-competitive of current uh, centralized financial activity and uh, trading environments and lending environments. And that's, that, that's the problem. Uh, in terms of the solution, think that uh, probably way too early to comment on exactly what that would look like. And uh, at the moment, uh, really just trying to do our homework as to what what something like that might even look like. And obviously, uh, at the moment, there's a lot of short-term uh, priorities and projects being pushed, and there's a balance between figuring out the long-term uh, the long-term solution and what the time horizons are on various L2 developments that could make something like this possible. And I think that more and more, it's becoming clear that uh, spending a lot more time doing research on various L2s and in particular zero knowledge uh, zero knowledge proofs and their ability to ensure uh, or to assist with doing a lot of this uh, the Oracle computation uh, off chain and integrating that with the with the network layer is going to be really important so uh, the more research that we can do collectively and get a handle on where the space is going and what's going to be the, you know, there is some notion of still needing to have oracles, uh, excuse me, orders that don't need to be updated. But the question then becomes how to integrate uh, oracles uh, that facilitate the updating of, of orders and liquidate and, and uh, guaranteeing liquidations into orders. Uh, can be integrated and uh, yeah, at least on this end, uh, not quite ready to talk about the appropriate implementation, but uh, very, very interesting questions there at the moment. Okay, we have a question from Guy, and they ask, where does liquid stock fit into the critical path of implementing a gauge system? Does one need to come before the other? Uh, it doesn't need to. Uh, it's it's one of those things where what is liquid stock? Uh, it's a it's an ERC twenty token that, in theory, comes with governance and uh, yield, and to some extent, that anyone can do that. But there's also an argument to be made that the that it would be in Beanstalk's interest to actually issue a variety of different types of liquid stock, um, to have one liquid stock be associated with uh, maybe BIP governance, one liquid stock be associated with yield, one liquid stock be associated with gauge governance, or even distribute the yield in terms of multiple uh, gauge governance votes. Uh, and distribute it that way to make it totally modular. Uh, so don't necessarily think that uh, 
it makes sense to implement liquid stock before the gauge system because uh, the gauge system may may uh, help offer color on how uh, liquid stock should actually work. And one can assume that delegation or vote delegation may somehow do that indirectly anyways, right? Where you can delegate your, your stock to someone and then someone can vote in the gauge, in the gauge system. If, if vote delegation anyways happens. Okay, I think we're at the end of the town hall uh, chat questions. So I'll pause here again for a minute, see if anyone else has a question that they would like to, to ask. Otherwise, we, we can end this class. Okay, thank you all for joining us today. And as always, thank you, Publius, for taking the time to answer these questions. And we'll see you all next week.